pastor here at Fairview. And I want you to know that you are welcome here this morning. If you are returning uh, after coming here week after week, year after year, you are welcome here. If you don't feel welcome, we want to make you feel welcome. We want to help you engage. If you are visiting this morning and looking for a church home, you are welcome here. If you are just visiting and checking out Jesus and seeing what church is all about, as you don't know that you believe this, you are welcome here. If you have any questions, if you're in any of those groups, we all have questions and we're all still discovering things about our faith and the Bible, please do reach out to Howard and myself. But this is not uh, the Howard or Dan show, but we are the body of Christ. Uh, feel free to reach out to people who use around you us to our readers, and of course, of course, to us as well. But we are a family in the body of Christ, and this is our church, this God's church. I have a few announcements for us this morning. The first is that we have many programs kicking off for the fall, starting back up. So we have Martha's Circle, which is launching uh, back on September 20th at 6.30 in the session room, down over there underneath the Fellowship Hall. Also, we have a Friday morning Bible study led by Martha Ponder, which is going to be studying Isaiah, I believe. And that will be starting back up on September 9th at 10.30 in the morning. And do you all also be in the session room? Yes, they'll also be in the session room. And finally, in terms of kickoffs, we have a new Wednesday night study starting this Wednesday. If you don't know, our Wednesday night programs are dinner at 6. Please do come and enjoy a meal and some fellowship followed by children's and adult uh, studies and programs at 6.30. This new study will also be led by Martha Ponder and is going to be going through a book by R.C. Scroll, or using a book by R.C. Scroll, that's talking about different kinds of worldviews, and that will be in room 11 downstairs. Also, if you've been with us, you may know about our ministry across the street, Michael's Room, which supplies various things to foster children. I know that we have depleted many of our resources, and there's still an amazing amount over there, but in terms of backpacks and some other things, as school started, foster families, and uh, DCF came over and, and uh, got a lot of the supplies, and there's a need to replenish some of those. So please do see our newsletter. Uh, if you get the email newsletter, uh, check that for what supplies are needed. If not, you can go on our website underneath more, and you should be able to access our newsletter there. Our last two announcements, hopefully, are, are brief. One is that we have a missions weekend coming up in two weeks. We'll have one of our missionaries, David Singh, here Sunday morning. He will be preaching, doing a, a Sunday school hour uh, interactive sort of thing. We can learn more. And then there will be uh, that evening a pop up supper and an opportunity to engage with him and the subject of global missions. Please do come uh, and engage and have time of fellowship as well. David is a phenomenal speaker uh, and also a great man who loves God's heart. And that's really the thing is he loves God and he's a great God. And God's done great things in him. He would be the first to say that, I think. But he is a, a great person to learn from and to hear about. So please do join us and it will be great. The last announcement is we have a youth retreat for 6th through 12th grade. Uh, and that will be October 14th to 16th. Please get uh, the money for that, which is $130 a student, uh, by October 7th to the office or to Andrew. And we do want everyone to be able to come. So if you have multiple kids or if that ends up, ends up adding up very quickly, please do see Andrew if there's scholarships available to help anybody who uh, that might be a barrier for. That's all our announcements this morning. And so please join me in our call to worship, which is printed in bowls and on the screens. Clap your hands, all you people. God has gone up with a shout of joy. The Lord Jesus Christ has risen to reign. His is the name above all names. We are witnesses. The Lord is risen. Christ has ascended. Let us worship him this morning, our sons of the Lord, with him 3 3, verses 1, 2, 5.
join me in our prayer and our confession. Dear Lord, we come before you today as your children. We praise you as the God of all creation and the giver of life. You have made us, saved us, and called us to be your people and to serve in your kingdom work. We confess that we too often forget we belong to you. We tend to live as though we must crucify ourselves apart from Christ, or else as if Christ's call requires nothing of us at all. Recall to us that our lives are not our own. Help us to live in faith, and let us neither forget nor ignore you. May we be faithful witnesses to your name and do our part in the world. Give us courage and strength to serve your world and to live in obedience to your word. Change our hard and fearful hearts by your spirit, O oh God, that we may live for you. Hear us as we continue our confession in the silence.
can have something orally in their language that they can understand. So we appreciate all that you guys have done to allow us to uh, make this happen. One of our colleagues was a consultant on this new testament that's just been finished. But all of us in the office that work in the U.S. are going to travel there to participate in the celebration and the dedication. So we're really excited about that. I've been recently in Congo finishing up an old project from the Whitley days that was really more a lot of story. The exciting thing is that the, the, a lot of the folks there are getting really excited about oral language translation and they've asked us to take a look at some of the languages left in Congo that need uh, translation. So we may be doing more things over there actually with spoken. Uh, Lois, what's been going on with you lately? Well, since mom passed away in January, I've been transitioning out of caregiver mode and now that we've moved to East Texas to Longview, getting to be grandma, much more uh, involved in the children of, in the lives of our five grandchildren that live here. By Thanksgiving, there will be a new, a new member of the family here, too, so that will be fun to have a lot of cuddle time with another little one. But I still uh, spend uh, about 20 hours a week working part-time for COVID on a volunteer basis, and I get to do some administrative tasks that make other people's lives easier and allow them to get money, um, things, little things like that. So, <laughs> um, a lot of people don't see what I do, but the people that I interact with appreciate my involvement. So, you can see behind us, Lois mentioned that we moved to Texas. Uh, and those of you that know that we used to live in Alabama, we're now in East Texas. If things look a little chaotic behind us, that's because we uh, threw an uh, African cloth over a bunch of the boxes of our stuff that we've moved, and uh, we're, we're just kind of making do. We're actually uh, uh, sharing the house with our son, and that's why I was mentioning the uh, new grandchild that's coming. They don't really do really that. So I thought we'd let you know a little bit about that. Uh, pray for our, uh, you know, getting settled here in, uh, in East Texas and some of the things that have to do in West Africa. Starting a new project there again, and that will bring me up to about four projects, which is way too much. So uh, we're hoping to offload some of that to some of the new people in Spoken. And so if you'll pray for that, we appreciate it. God bless you, and thanks again so much for all that you've done for us through the years. Bye. Let's go to God. Let's go to God in prayer, and uh, then we'll pray for the hunters and other concerns. And we'll close with the Lord's prayer. Lord, we thank you for the relationships that have been built over many years with brothers and sisters in Christ who go far away and share the faith, share the good news. We're going to be a part of this work, part of translation in through uh, various parts of Africa. And other places in the world. Thank you for Tim and Lois. We pray that, uh, that the concerns they have raised, that you may answer and you may bring swift resolutions to. We ask for more workers and helpers in the nations and people groups they are seeking to reach. Uh, we pray that they may get some help in relief, guide them in helping as they grieve, but also, but also uh, should enjoy the anticipation of. New grandchild. Help us as we are in our own places and lives and contexts uh, to be those who go out and even though we may speak the same language as most of the people around us, we know that you call us to be part of your kingdom. So help us to translate the needs, concerns, difficulties of the world, the praises, the good things, the joy. In ways that reveal who you are and who you are at work. Let's be ambassadors and translators of your kingdom in the world around us. Let us show your hope and promise where there may be despair. Words you can come.
encouragement to the presence where there may be loss and doubt. Your faithfulness, your faith may win. With whatever gifts you have given us, I pray that you can grow and share. God is with you guys and lead us to following Jesus and seeing your spirit at work. So that we may be built up. We may extend your kingdom across whatever space you provide us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus and the praise of God is saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
that was really when he gets too scared. Jesus, Solomon was almost uh, So, today's sermon is roughly the same sermon as last week. Um, so, if you weren't here, great. Uh, but it's got different Bible passages, different stories, um, and, and a few different words. So, if you heard last week's sermon, hopefully this can fill it in even more. And I realized when I got here this morning that I had brought the exact same outfit to wear if you're not even in service that I had worn last week. And I haven't quite realized that. It's a wig. So, uh, I kind of threw a jacket on instead of a pullover. Uh, but if you heard some of these same things last week, that's fine. That's good. They're, they're good things. You know, the Bible's one book. There's a lot of stuff that's similar to that. So uh, good to heed all of it and deepen in, uh, in any part that we can. So last week I talked about having a posture of walking after Jesus, of walking with God, rather than just being worried about standing before God, what our status is in relation to God. But this whole year we've been talking about talking about our faith. And how do we start doing that? Well, part of the reason we need to have the right posture of walking with God is that the right posture leads us to the right conversations. Not just starting the right conversations, but finding and continuing the right conversations as well. There are plenty of books on talking about our faith. And many of them are very good. Books on evangelism, books on workplace ministry. But it's also good to look through Scripture and see how Jesus himself prepares us for the task of walking out into the world being sent by him. Books are good. Books are helpful. We can give you a list of some books. But my job here is to get to the root of things in Scripture. Plus, sometimes books can make things a bit too, well, make things maybe seem more complicated than they are. They try to get prescriptions and processes for things that quite often just come from posture and practice and ultimately from the heart. We can have a set formula but when something goes awry, how do we respond? The unexpected happens, then our responses, our interactions in the world are uh, quite often better governed by our posture and our practice, our routines and, uh, and the things that we have been well than they are through some rubric of how to have conversations, specifically how to share the gospel. It's kind of like the boxer Mike Tyson said one time, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. And then, after that, maybe some of your plan will still work. But if you practice your movements and your punches and your well conditioned, you will be able to roll with it because you've got the overall posture correct, got the overall practice correct. So when the Holy Spirit leads us, He doesn't always follow precise methods and prescribed rules. Sharing the gospel is about sharing with people, and people can be different one minute to the next. The relationships with people can be very fluid. They're not science experiments or legal proceedings or instruction booklets that send you in a specific way. If that way doesn't work, then well, okay, you just try it a different way. You've got to kind of keep going with people. Plus, whereas God once chose his law as the way that we can know him and be like him, he ultimately chose to reveal himself completely in a person in Jesus. I talked about this a little bit last week as well. I mentioned that the people who were most prone to questioning Jesus and eventually criticizing him, the group called the Pharisees, subscribed to a couple of things. The need to uphold and enforce God's law as they understood it, and the notion that God resided in the temple in Jerusalem. But Jesus made the point that the temple is no longer the location of God because he himself is now the location of God because he is God. Therefore, following him took precedence over the system of the law as the Pharisees and whoever else interpreted it. He didn't break the law, but he revealed his true purpose and fulfillment. So we start with a posture of walking after Jesus in the life rather than simply standing before him at death. 
And if we're doing that, then we follow where he leads. And if we do that, then he leads us to people. And he sends us to people and puts us in a position to do his will. So when Jesus sends us, how do we go and what do we say? One of the best examples of Jesus sending his followers is the first 12 verses of Luke chapter 10, the Gospel of Luke. And that's our passage for today. Let me pray before I read. Heavenly Father, open our ears and hearts and minds to receive your word and pursue your will. Give us hearts that come from your kingdom as your ambassadors in the world. Let us be hosts of your kingdom as well, even when we may be guests of foreigners of this land. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Luke 10, 1 through 12. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, Pray earnestly to the Lord of harvest so to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, they will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that time. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. There's a lot in here. Uh, I've preached on this passage many times. In fact, I could have sworn I preached on it a few times here, but I thought I really, really used it tangentially. Uh, so the material for many sermons in this passage. We'll focus on a couple of things today, though. The first is that when Jesus sends his disciples out, he told them to extend peace. If it was received, they stay. If their peace was not received, it would return to them. It's verses 5 through 7. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon it. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from the house. So were they supposed to stay in the house even if their peace did not rest upon the owner of that house? Even if their peace wasn't received? And it appears so because Jesus' very next line is to remain in the house. Now he also talks at the end of the passage about his disciples being rejected from the town and shaking the dust off their shoes. But I would make the case that not having their peace Return and being rejected from the town were different things. It would be easy to read this as the disciples possibly faced two different outcomes. Either their peace is accepted and they stay, or it's not accepted and they leave. But I don't think it's as simple as that. It rarely is as simple as that. If these were the only two options, then there would be very little room the possibility of living with tension and discomfort. But life has a lot of tension and discomfort, right? What if their peace is not received, but they remain in as Jesus seems to say? Now, having seen this kind of dynamic in our own lives, sometimes when we convey peace, it gives peace to other people. It helps other people be at peace. And that's great. Other times when we convey peace, it has no effect on other people, and it might actually seem to aggravate them even more or make things worse. But when that happens, we might still have to be around those people over and over and over. 
I mean, if you're trying to share peace with someone at your job, and they don't take kindly to it, do you just want to quit your job? If you try to share peace with someone in your family, and they reject it, are you just going to not talk with them again at family events? I mean, sometimes that becomes the case when it's years and years of the same thing, but after just one time, after just a bit of introduction, Maybe even after there's already a relationship there. So when our peace helps other people be at peace, it's great. What happens when our peace does not rest on other people? How do we take it? Well, it'd be very easy to get discouraged. That's why it's important that, that, that Jesus tells them that if their peace is rejected, it will return to them. They don't get their peace from other people, or even from other people's response to their peace. They get it from Jesus himself, which allows them to be at peace, even amidst the tension and discomfort. And Jesus is sending them to live in discomfort. So he's sending you out a sheep among wolves. And they'll probably need to dwell alongside lots of people who rejected their peace. After all, having peace rejected doesn't mean that they themselves were rejected. They were going into houses and towns seeking hospitality. And hospitality was a high expectation in those days. People were encouraged to welcome the stranger, to be hospitable to the stranger around them. It was expected to be extended widely. And it didn't always have to be extended with a smile. But it was a characteristic of communal survival. But Jesus' disciples were not simply seeking hospitality with no strings attached. In Jesus' instructions, there's the expectation that they will not just be interlopers, but workers where they go. They were joining other people's households for a time, and that meant participating in the household economy. They weren't just imposing on people, they were asking to join in whatever the household was doing. Even if their peace was not received initially, they're going to be in partnership with their hosts, not facing one another as adversaries, but facing something together, side by side, over time. When that's happening, even if peace did not happen at first, peace may indeed come. Because by working together and committing to time together, the disciples were giving the Holy Spirit a chance to break into their relationship. Plus, what does it say if we try to extend peace and it's not immediately returned and we just up and walk away from the situation? Well, it kind of says that our peace may not have been that peaceful after all. It's not a peace that can endure a little bit of hardship. Is it really peace? If our peace is dependent upon the reception that we get from other people, then is it really the peace that Jesus gives? The Holy Spirit is always trying to break into our relationships. He's not just working on us so that we can have a better personal spiritual life. That's part of it. But he's pointing us to Jesus and calling us to do the same for others. If we have a posture of following Jesus, then we recognize that. Surely we've all had times when our first encounters with someone have been rough or difficult. But then over time and through mutual striving, we develop close relationships. That's what Jesus is expecting to happen, even if his disciples don't have the best first encounter. So whether they got a good reception or not, they're supposed to have the peace that he's given them to remain in the homes of their hosts. But even if they did, what were they supposed to say? Well, as Jesus puts it, they were supposed to say that the kingdom of God has come near. That's what they were supposed to say if they were received. And that's what they were supposed to say if they were eventually rejected and thrown out of town. And that's what they were supposed to say if they kept staying in the meantime, even in the, even in the uncomfortable times between. When Jesus was present with his disciples on earth, one of the main things he talked about was the kingdom of God. 
One of his main messages was that the kingdom of God has come. He performed miracles and signs. He taught people the right ways to understand God's law. And he revealed to people the true character of God. Then he would talk about the kingdom of God. And he would say the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom of God is with you. But when Jesus said the kingdom of God is come near, he didn't mean that the kingdom of God was pending. It didn't mean that the kingdom of God was almost here. It didn't mean it was going to come any minute now. No, he meant that the kingdom of God is literally, physically here. All of the things that Jesus did, all of the things that he taught were evidence of the kingdom of God. Not simply because they were miraculous, they were profound, but because it was Jesus who was doing it. Jesus was the one who was near. Back then, there's a common conception that the kingdom of God was something that was going to happen at the end of time. I think we have a little bit of that expectation in all of us. I think the disciples and the Pharisees and others had that expectation too. If the kingdom of God is near, then you must be saying that the end is near. In one of the places where I used to live, there was a sign in a field just outside of town along the highway. And a big sign, Calfield, just kind of random. And it said, prepare to meet God. Which I had a picture of. Prepare to meet God. Now, if you're driving along that highway and you see that sign, what do you think? Honestly, our first reaction might be that someone is trying to tell us that the end is near. Or perhaps someone is trying to remind us that death may come before we know it. I have to admit that I initially interpreted that sign that way, simply because I assume that when someone is telling me to prepare to meet God, then they mean that the end is coming soon. That's just the way I've been conditioned to think. I think a lot of us have been conditioned to think that way. But what if the person who put the sign up, prepared to meet God, was actually trying to prepare people for a miracle or a healing? What if the person was trying to say that Jesus, or someone on Jesus' behalf, was near, was going to be with them? When Jesus told people that the kingdom of God was near, he meant that it was right there, right then. And because he was resurrected, and because after his resurrection he ascended and sent us the Holy Spirit, it means that the kingdom of God is still present in all the work that the Holy Spirit does. That doesn't mean that the kingdom of God is fully here, but it means that the kingdom of God is here in many ways. Whenever we see the work of the Holy Spirit, we see the kingdom of God at work. Jesus and the Father sent the Holy Spirit to keep revealing the kingdom of God to us, just as the Father sent Jesus to reveal his own true nature to us. So if someone's telling you to prepare to meet God, are you prepared to meet God? When you're on your way to the store, when you're on your way to work, when you're on your way to see family, you see a sign on the side of the road that says prepare to meet God, are you prepared to meet God in the next few minutes? Not just, you know, dying or being at the pearly gates, but are you prepared for God to show up wherever you might be going? But it's not just Jesus and it's not just the Holy Spirit who was sent to reveal the kingdom of God, it's also us. But do we expect to find the kingdom of God along our everyday paths? Here we find Jesus sending his disciples into the towns around where he had been at work. But instead of telling them to go and make pronouncements to people right off the bat, or even go and start teaching in the synagogues of those towns, Jesus told them to go and live in people's homes and work alongside them. So what does it mean to be sent by Jesus? Well, in this case, we discover that sometimes when Jesus sends people, he sends them as guests. He may send us as guests. But we are guests with a message that the kingdom of God has come here. But we're still guests. We're citizens of the kingdom of God, but we're guests in someone's home. Citizens of an eternal kingdom, 
but sojourners, foreigners, guests in this world. But do we know how to be good guests? The Bible tells us to practice hospitality, and we know that we're supposed to be good hosts. Hebrews 13.2 says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing them. But does Christian hospitality also extend to being good guests? Can a guest demonstrate hospitality? Well, if we know that we are citizens not only of the present world, but also of the kingdom of God, and that the Holy Spirit can reveal that kingdom anywhere, then aren't we also the hosts of that kingdom, wherever we see it present? Aren't we also hosts of the kingdom that we know, and that God calls us to share with others? Is this the posture of which Jesus sent his disciples then? Well, yeah, let's look at what Jesus tells his disciples to do when they go as guests. Jesus says, carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Now, why not the money bag? Seems like they might need one if they're going out to a place they don't know. Well, the Greek word here also means money belt. So Jesus was telling his disciples not to take a fanny pack. And that's good fashion sense. Good job with Jesus there. And after all, if the disciples had gone out and they carry fanny packs, everybody would have known they were American tourists and they would have been rejected. Um, no, but Jesus is asking them, or telling them to take no more money than they needed to get from one place to another. He wanted them to go to a place and work and have to work and be there to work alongside the people of that place. He also told them not to take a nap set. Well, Jesus was probably no surprise, deeply aware of some of the philosophies of his day. Based on everything that Jesus is telling his disciples to do in this passage, go to a town, work with the people there, live with them, stay true to their message, even if they reject the teaching, don't carry anything extra with you. By telling his disciples to do that, he is setting them in contrast with another traveling group of people that would have been going from town to town around that time. And that group of people was called, and I love this, they were called cynics. Like cynical cynicism, they were called cynics. They subscribed to an ancient Greek philosophy called cynicism that had arrived a couple hundred years ago and waned a little bit, but was regaining popularity here in the early years of the Roman Empire. So there were new cynics who were going from town to town and saying what they believed or didn't believe or being cynical about the state of the world. Now that obviously plays into the way that we use the term cynicism today. It's not exactly the same. But the ancient cynics believed in self-sufficiency and a rejection of the economic and social structures of the day. But Jesus is sending his disciples out to not be self-sufficient, to depend on others, and to work in the economy of whatever place they were going. Here's how cynics were described. These cynics posted themselves in street corners and alleyways and to the gates, pass around the hat, and play on the credulity of lads and sailors and crowds of that sort, drinking together rough jokes, and much tittle-tattle, I think it's a full description, and much tittle-tattle and that low badminton that smacks of the marketplace. They were socially marginal critics, wandering on the periphery of cities, attracting crowds with their irreverent social barge, and living off of whatever they could beg from their listeners. They typically carried bags or purses, which were supposed to indicate their self-sufficiency. Signal their mind was their navigation to the conventional norms of the social so they're essentially social media influencers, they're just getting money for their commentary and the things that they say about the world and their hot takes on what's going on around them. They carry bags and collect whatever money people will give them. And what they're spouting is cynicism, pointing out the follies and foibles of the world around them while still keeping at a bit of a distance. 
So by not carrying bags and not carrying persons, and by sticking to their message and dwelling with the people, Jesus' disciples are sending a signal to the people who they visited that they are not cynics. What's more, while the cynics carry a person back, Jesus is sending his disciples out and telling them to not be self-sufficient. He tells them to go live with the people and work alongside them. Eat whatever is placed before them. Well, that's a big deal because Jesus' disciples were Jewish. A lot of the people they might have been visiting were not. The Jews had strict food laws that Jesus was telling his disciples to go as far as to eat whatever was placed in front of them. So not only was he telling his disciples to not reject the work and the customs of the people who they were visiting, he was telling them to join them in their work and eat freely at their tables. And of course he was telling them not to be cynics. But while ancient cynics, uppercase C, described, subscribed to a formal system of philosophy in their day, we can take this to heart in our own day as well because we live in a world full of lowercase c cynicism. The world of skepticism and doubt, of biting commentary and pithy bars. A world where cynicism is often received as a way to get in with someone or gain attention. But even though Jesus was sending his disciples out with the greatest piece of truth that could be spoken, the kingdom of God had come near. He sent them out not as philosophers or commentators, but as guests. Guests who would develop relationships. Jesus sent them out not as self-sufficient know-it-alls, but as workers who would earn their keep and be dependent on the hospitality of others, dwelling with them even in their houses. Actually, the word for house, for house was oikos. That's where we get the word economy. Jesus was sending them out not to reject everyone's economy of life, but to join in it. Sending them out vulnerable to be part of the households where they went. Of course, they may have been vulnerable, but they weren't just turning themselves over to their hosts. Jesus makes it clear that whenever, wherever the disciples went, and whoever took them in, God was putting them there for a reason. He tells them to go prayerfully and to communicate peace. If people received their peace, then it was God's affirmation that they had gone to the right house. And that's important because the truth is strong as the coming of the kingdom of God cannot be simply blurted out and used as a means to intimidate people. Not just used as a means to reject what people think or say or do. To communicate God's presence, we don't go to the outskirts of town and just put up a sign that says prepare to meet God. No, we dwell with people and form relationships. Because when the kingdom of God came near, he dwelt with people and formed relationships. That's why Jesus is so much more than his teachings and his miracles. Jesus' very presence is the kingdom of God. And as the Father sent Jesus, Jesus sends us. So saying the kingdom of God is near means being present and having peace in the midst of whatever the world sends because our peace comes from Him. It means dwelling with Him and staying on the message about the goodness of God's kingdom. It means looking out for it and pointing to it. You know, these folks in Jesus' time, I mentioned the Pharisees, uh, held to the popular conception that, that God dwelt in the temple in Jerusalem. And when people were going to the temple for festival days, there was a set of psalms, there is a set of psalms, they're great psalms, we still have them, that are psalms of ascent. As they were ascending the hills into Jerusalem, they would sing these songs about how wonderful it is to go to the house of the Lord, how good it is for brothers to walk together, how wonderful it is to worship. All of those things are true. But Jesus is turning it around a little bit too. There are songs of blessing that he has called us to be Because it's a joyful thing to go from the house 
the Lord. To go to the presence of God is already out there with us. That is calling to Jesus' kids because his kingdom is present. So as we go out, do we go out with peace or do we, do we go out as cynics? Do we maintain peace or do we play into the world's cynicism? If we go out with peace, the peace of God himself, and we maintain it in the world of cynicism, and through that peace, people become to know the difference between the sin of the world around them and the peace of the kingdom of God. And we have the opportunity to express the best news that the kingdom of God is not distant but is coming near. We find the Spirit leading us in that. The kingdom of God is not just at the end, but is present with us. He is present with us. When that is our posture, then we can start to see more evidence of His kingdom's goodness than of our world's failures. When that happens, as we're dwelling alongside others in the world, you can point to those signs of the kingdom, reveal them, and show them. And then follow the sign and the Lord's Okay. One of the signs and seals of his presence and his work that Jesus gave us is the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. For in this Supper, we participate with Him. We eat and drink along with Him, along with His disciples, with one another, with brothers and sisters in Christ, who do so as well. On the night of His betrayal, Jesus took bread, and He blessed it and broke it. He said, This is my body, broken for you. Take me and do this. In the same way, also, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Scripture instructs us to examine ourselves and we prepare to take these elements, lest we invite judgment upon ourselves. When we are judged by the Lord, we are dis disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. We have confessed our sins and disciplined one another. We have been sure of our forgiveness in Christ Jesus. We have heard his word, and now we come to the table. Let us pray. O God, who by Jesus' blood and body, his death and resurrection, has provided us a new and living way into the relationship that you desire to have with us. Cleanse our minds and hearts with the work of the Holy Spirit so that as we come forth, we may do so with a pure heart and undefiled conscience. We may receive these gifts contained by sin and go forth with shining your light and proclaiming your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray. Amen. Friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord. Our God. Amen. These gifts of God for the people of God, all who proclaim faith in Jesus, they come forward and receive these elements. And today,
and you may come forth and receive the elements as you are able, and if you are not able, we will come and, uh, and share the with you. Having taken these elements together, let us now stand and proclaim what we believe together, saying, the Apostles' Creed or affirmation of faith was printed in the bulletin and on our church. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary.
how to peace can be shaken by the world around us with the peace that Jesus gives, which we may extend to others, and which returns to us even in the most difficult times. And in that peace, find the ways that the Holy Spirit is working, so you may see and proclaim His kingdom. As you go in the hands of Christ in your wounds, may the Holy Spirit bring to your minds just the things that you need to hear, and may you dwell in the Father's arms. here.